Hello, and welcome to Kettle and Bones, where we make really delicious, really healthy food. And you can too. Today's recipe is for a spectacularly opulent and luxurious sampler platter, ideal for small, socially responsible gatherings within your bubble of close family and friends. It is delicious, that's always what we strive for in our food, but it's also just beautiful. This will actually be more of an exercise in plating and presentation than actual cooking. We're making an elegant sashimi blossom. Let's get cooking. Except, eh, we're not actually going to be doing that much cooking today. We'll be assembling a beautiful and inviting appetizer using fresh vegetables and sashimi-grade fish. I suppose this will be sort of a deconstructed sushi sampler. I'm going to build mine on a flat appetizer platter, but any shallow tray will do. Round is best if you have it. Our sashimi blossom is going to sit atop a background of beautiful leafy vegetation. So I'm starting with some leaves of baby bok choy, a variety of cabbage that is commonly used in Asian cooking. Like other cabbages, the leaves come bunched together in a head. I simply chopped off the bottom to separate the leaves, then I removed the stalk from each leaf. We need these to sit flat on our platter, so we're using just the green leafy part. If you were cooking bok choy in a stir-fry, for example, you'd be separating the leaves from the stalks anyway because the stalks need to cook longer than the leaves, so save these for a nice simple meat and veggie stir-fry later on. With our bok choy leaves arranged in a nice ring around the plate, Let's add our next layer. Kombu, dried salted kelp. It often comes in large sheets, so for our purposes, we're going to cut this into long strips. Use a firm knife stroke. This can be kind of resistant to being cut. It's also resistant to being chewed if it hasn't been cooked. So in a pan over medium high heat, I'm heating a little splash of avocado oil. And once that is hot, one by one, in go our kombu slices. These will not take long at all to bubble up and get crispy. I have actually heard fried kombu compared to bacon. Blasphemous, in my opinion. But I will say, it does come out salty and crunchy in a similar, albeit inferior way. It is tasty though, and it's gonna go great with the other flavors on our platter. One other thing to mention about kombu. It is not a zero-carb food. A slice this size contains roughly between one half and one gram of carbs, depending on its thickness. So you wouldn't want to sit down and eat a whole bowl of this, too salty anyway. It's going to be best in small bites along with our other ingredients. I just wanted to mention that because if your margins for carbs today are razor thin, maybe take it easy on the kombu. And these are nice and crunchy. This is going to be a great texture to complement our sashimi, which is not crunchy at all. I'm arranging our kombu strips in more or less a symmetrical way on top of our bok choy leaves. Next, here we go. We're going to start layering on our lovely sashimi. I'm starting with one of my favorite fish for sushi and sashimi, yellowtail or hamachi. This is a firm, meaty, clean-tasting fish, not a fishy-tasting fish at all. If I was introducing someone to sushi for the first time, this is the kind of fish I would start them on. The cross-section of this fillet has some wonderful light and dark pink coloration, which is going to be perfect for the botanical aesthetic we are creating. We talked a little bit about slicing technique in our No Rice Sushi Rolls episode, and the same is going to hold true here. You need a very sharp knife, make sure you sharpen your blade before you start, and you need to use a decisive stroke with a minimum amount of sawing back and forth. The more sawing you do, the more you'll be tearing your sashimi slices apart. The key to thin, uniform slices of sashimi is having the right balance between downward pressure and movement of the knife stroke. Also, you'll notice that this fillet is thick in the center and narrow at the ends, so I want mostly center cuts so that my slices will all be more or less the same size. 
I did the same thing with a lovely cut of bluefin tuna, or maguro. Again, a sharp knife and a decisive stroke are key. And last but not least, we'll get a really nice floral orange color from some slices of salmon. Here's a pro tip for working with sashimi. If you have to set it aside for a bit outside of the fridge, use a plastic bag full of ice laid over the top to keep it cold at a safe temperature. Beginning with our yellowtail slices, I'm arranging them in a ring on top of our bok choy and kombu. I want to have the dark pink corner of each slice facing out so it will stay visible as we add some more ingredients. Next, I'm adding our tuna slices. I want these to appear as if they are radiating out from the center, as flower petals would do. This is looking very flowery indeed. Our last layer of sashimi will be our salmon, overlapping slightly in the very center and closing our circle of ingredients. Nice. That's it for the fish. Now I'm going to add a few more items for color, texture, and flavor, just more variety, generally. I have some thin slices of daikon radish, adding some streaks of white and a nice crunch. Similarly, I have some scallions that I've cut at a very sharp angle, giving the pieces long, thin points. This adds a nice sort of grassy look. I want to add just a little bit of flavor to the sashimi now. Nothing too intense, but I want it to have a little something to further intrigue the senses. I made a very simple seasoning liquid using about three parts rice vinegar and one part sesame oil with just a squeeze of lemon juice. I don't want anything overpowering, just a little hint of additional flavor. I'm brushing this on very lightly, again, just for a subtle nudge of flavor. If you decide you want something different, uh, maybe you want to make sure each slice of sashimi is seasoned a little more uniformly. You could certainly season each sashimi layer as you lay it on. It's up to you. You know what? I don't love the scallions sitting on top of the sashimi layer. I'm concerned that we might lose sight of our beautiful pink and orange colors. Let's tuck those underneath the edges. Yeah, that's much better. The centerpiece of the platter will be a hefty helping of Tobiko, flying fish eggs. You can get these in a variety of colors. They're colored in various ways using things like squid ink to make the black ones, or wasabi for the green ones. An international market that carries sashimi-grade fish is most likely going to have at least some kind of fish eggs for sushi. Tobiko come from flying fish. Masago is another variety that comes from the capelin fish that's native to the North Atlantic and Arctic. Masago are a little smaller than Tobiko, and they tend to be a little less expensive, so you may see Masago sold as a sushi garnish as well. Believe it or not, if you can't find this locally, you can order it online. Fish eggs. Online. Who would have thought? Bottom line, this is caviar, and you should expect to pay caviar prices. 100 grams, or roughly 4 ounces, probably cost you about 10 US dollars, depending on your location. I told you this was a luxurious and elegant thing we're making, but you don't need tons of it. Just a little mound to cover and color the center. If you don't want to pay for caviar, or maybe you just don't care for it, you could do something like a little mound of cream cheese. That's another popular sushi fusion ingredient. I do like fish eggs, and fish eggs are perfect in terms of the look and texture for the center or ovary of the flower. Yeah, look it up. That's really what it's called. Next, we're going to insert some flat, thin cucumber slices. These are cucumber halves that I sliced thinly the long way. These add some very pleasing shades of green to the mix. I like the overall planty, organic feel that the cucumber seeds bring in visually. And cucumber, of course, is a very common sushi ingredient. It's a good fit on all counts. 
So is avocado. Very popular with sushi, especially with tuna, and lest we become bewitched by the beauty of our platter and forget to bear in mind the nutritional stats, avocado contains some very healthy fats indeed. Next, I'm going to lightly sprinkle on another very popular sushi garnish, toasted sesame seeds. Just a light dusting. And that, my friends, is our elegant and luxurious sashimi blossom finished. Beautiful. Even if sashimi just isn't your thing, that would just be a shame. It's so healthy and nutritious. But you can't deny, this is a gorgeous plate of food. Imagine your guests approaching the appetizer table, their eyes scanning the foodscape before coming to rest on this edible bloom of color and flavor. This is the kind of dish that makes people pause in mid-step, put their hand over their heart and gasp, Oh my! But if you're not serving sushi lovers, I guess this could be a charcuterie plate. Thinly sliced meats, layered on top of lettuce and spinach leaves, garnishing with sticks of carrot and celery, maybe a nice cheese ball in the center. That could work. I could have done that instead, but I don't know. Elegant salami blossom just didn't have quite the same ring to it, you know? Like all our recipes, exactly what you choose to grow your flour from is up to you. Stay with Kettle and Bones for many, many more super classy ideas to help gussy up your next smorgasbord with beautiful and nutritious colors, flavors, and textures. But for now, just enjoy your elegant sashimi blossoms.